Hello everybody, my name is Rachel and welcome to my channel, Kalanadi. Today I'm going to do my very late Booktubeathon wrap-up. I should have done this last weekend and I didn't. Um, I've been busy, things haven't cooperated. I thought it would be brilliant to get up early on a Sunday morning when it's dead quiet and film and I'm not awake yet. I'm having complete brain freezes and I'm trying really hard not to sneeze every five seconds. <laughs> this is how the sausage is made. All right. Um, Booktubeathon, the 2018 edition, went really well. Um, I completed all the reading challenges again, and I read seven books in seven days. Though it kind of got down to the wire, I finished my last book like four hours before the readathon ended. So, but I, I made it happen. Um, so I'm going to start off with Henry IV Part Two by Shakespeare. Uh, this completed three of the challenges for me. It won the coin toss, so I read it first. I watched an adaptation of it, and it has green on the cover. Um, I, sadly, I don't have much to say about this. I enjoyed it quite a bit, as much as the first part. I talked a little bit about Part One last week, I think, and uh, pretty much the same stuff. Um, father-son relationships, another rebellion against Henry IV doesn't go very well, and uh, Prince Hal maybe is gonna be a decent king? I don't know. I skipped most of the Falstaff parts when I was watching the adaptation. I did read all of them, but I, I didn't care for Falstaff anymore, and there's more of him in part two, unfortunately. I just do not get the humor of his character, so anyway. That's that. Then for the challenge of read a book about something you want to do, I read The Content Strategy Toolkit by Megan Casey because content strategy, I'm interested in it. I kind of sort of do it, but I want to do it more. It's complicated. Um, so this wasn't quite what I thought it was going to be. I think it's almost more broadly about how to propose a project and then project management and the end result in this case happens to be a content strategy that works for your organization. Despite that kind of mismatch between what I thought I was going to be reading and what I ended up reading, this is a really good book. It's a great resource and it contains a ton of document templates that'll be very useful. So even though it was a bit more generic than I thought it was going to be, I could actually take some of this stuff and use it at work, which is kind of the point. Yeah, it did what it needed to do. Then I read a book with a beautiful spine, which is Lizard Radio by Pat Schmotz. Um, this is a young adult science fiction dystopia, except it probably doesn't resemble anything that comes to mind when I say YA dystopia. It's different from the big name dystopias that have been dominating like all media recently. <laughs> um, this is really more focused on themes of gender and gender conformity. There's not a lot of description of how the broader world has turned out to be and why, but there are these hints that people have to conform, and if they don't, and if they don't test highly enough, um, they kind of get kicked out of society. They become non-persons who live in these, I think they're called blight cities. Um, so most of this takes place at a camp for teenagers, which is kind of a cross between summer camp, science camp, and prison camp. <laughs> Um, basically, um, teenagers are dumped there in order to be like indoctrinated, and if they pass camp, then they'll successfully become adults in society, and if they don't pass, then they drop out of society. Um, so the main character is a teenage girl named Kevali, who's 15 or 16, and for the purposes of this, I'm going to call her a girl and I'm going to use female pronouns because that's what she's opted for, but she is non-binary in the sense that the reader can see that, but she has never been given that label by society. So she thinks she's one or the other, male or female, and has to come to the realization that she can choose to not be either, to be her own thing. Um, so in this world, 
transgender people are recognized. In fact, they do early testing on children to determine their gender preferences and they will um, help them transition and you know, learn how to conform to societal expectations of their chosen gender, but it's still very rigidly male or female. You can switch, but you have to conform to the black and white categories. And if you don't, then you're like Cavalli called a bender, or I think that's kind of a shortened form of gender bender. Cavalli gets sent to this like agricultural teenage camp for a summer and is not really sure why she's there. Her adoptive mother had always said she wouldn't send her to one, but she rather abruptly changes her mind, doesn't explain why. So for a lot of the book, Kivali kind of acts like this is a joke, like any minute now her mother's gonna show up and tell her she can leave and it's not, none of this is really gonna have to happen. It doesn't quite go the way that she expects. Um, so. I think the issues of gender and this the experience of the teenagers at this camp and Cavalli struggling with her identity and her attraction to another girl and everything, that was really interesting. I really liked the almost like tunnel vision perspective you have in the story from Cavalli's very limited experience. It's a very internal story and one of the things I like the best about that is this thing called Lizard Radio. She tunes into this thing called Lizard Radio, which doesn't make a lot of sense except it's basically a, a meditative trance-like state where she goes somewhere else. And I think a lot of people don't quite get that when they read this book. Like, they don't think it's explained very well. I actually really understood that. I, I thought this was just a great depiction of the internal experiences that people have, a thing that you can't even really explain to other people because it's so unique to your experience. It's only in your head and nobody else will ever really know what it is. So it was kind of strange, but I could relate because I've sometimes done similar things, you know, in the confines of my own imagination, just escaping somewhere else in an experience that almost feels like it's physically real, you kind of go into that almost meditative state and you forget the, your surroundings and everything. So yeah, they did a lot of interesting things, but I have, I have to say I found the end of this book to be a little unsatisfying. It is kind of going in the direction of teenage girl rebels against society and decides to not conform to rebel and escape rather than conform, but then it just stops. And I'm, I felt like there were some broader questions about the world that needed to be answered and that there were still things that needed to happen before Kevali could get out or change things, so I don't know. It was definitely a very interesting read and I think if you approach it more as a book about gender and sexuality and identity, it's probably more satisfying than if you view it as a YA dystopia. Then I read a book while wearing the same hat the entire time and that was The Woodwife by Terry Wendling. This was hands down my favorite book of the entire week. It is a kind of a contemporary story about a 40-year-old woman named Maggie Black. She was formerly a poet, now a journalist. She's been living kind of, I don't know, kind of a bohemian artistic life, moving from city to city. Um, she's been in correspondence with a famous but reclusive poet for about 20 years, I think. And he dies under some mysterious circumstances and she discovers that he's left her his estate, his house and, and his land in Tucson, Arizona. And she decides she kind of needs a an, an fresh start. She is going to move out to his house in Arizona, go through his papers, his stuff, and try to write a biography of him because he was quite famous in his day. Uh, but when she arrives, she discovers she's not really in urban Tucson, Arizona. She's out in the desert. 
and it's kind of a culture shock. She ex did not expect to be in this particular setting in the middle of nowhere in the desert, and it's very different from any place she's ever lived before. So that's the first thing I loved about this book is the sense of place, the setting, the desert. It's, it's almost a character itself. It's described so well you could really feel the landscape. It's beautiful. You can tell that the author like lived there and knew what she was writing about. And then when Maggie is there, she starts learning about the people around there and she starts discovering the things that happened to the poet and his lover, who was uh, a kind of famous Mexican painter. And it, it slowly unravels some of the supernatural connections. I'm not sure if supernatural is the right word. Um, this is what you call mythic fantasy, and it's kind of a genre of fantasy that Wendling was very influential in bringing to the fore in the 80s and 90s. But that's another thing that I loved about this is it's mythic fantasy. It has to do with the mythology and the folklore of this area, of the American Southwest, and it's, it's gently blended into the contemporary world in this absolutely beautiful and kind of harsh and stark landscape. Just the atmosphere. It was great. Um, but yeah, everything about this, the characters, the writing, the setting, the way the story developed, um, it really sucked me in and I just I had to keep reading the book. I sat down and I read most of it in one sitting after I got past the initial setup. I was like, I just have to know what's actually going to happen. I have to know the answers and the explanations for all of the mysterious events and everything. So this was an excellent book. I highly recommend it. And I think it's still in print, so people should be able to find it. And then I finished off three other books in order to get up to seven books. Um, firstly, I have Iraq Plus 100, which is an anthology of Iraqi speculative fiction. It's edited by Hassan Blasim, who also has a story in here. Unfortunately, I really didn't enjoy most of this anthology. Um, most of the stories, in my opinion, suffered from one or two problems. Uh, one, graphic, violent imagery and events that I personally didn't want to read about. For example, the very first story has sexual assault and rape themes. There are at least two stories about human cannibalism or aliens using human bodies as food sources, and I really didn't want to read about aliens eating human fetuses like candy, um, and just other things kind of like that. Um, the second thing is that I thought a lot of the stories in here were not developed very well. Some of them I just outright thought that they weren't written that well. Uh, many of them didn't even feel like complete stories, but more like vignettes that didn't really have plots. <laughs> Um, there's kind of a, a shape or a form that I expect of an actual story, and many of these just felt like they didn't complete the structure, they didn't have a real ending, many of them just abruptly stopped and I was like, that's it? That's where you're gonna leave me? Nothing's actually happened yet. <laughs> so. I was overall disappointed that some, some of the content was extremely off-putting and then that I didn't think a lot of the stories were even written that well. I think there were two stories in here that I found memorable that I kind of liked, but everything else was basically on the two-star level. The, the good things about this anthology though, um, and the reason why I rated it overall at three stars rather than two, is that the introduction and the afterword are very interesting. I think that this project as an anthology was really put into context well. It endeavors to do something important, and I would definitely read another anthology like this from Iraq or um, someplace in that area. It's, it's worth reading for that, but it fell short of the mark for me in both content that I wanted to read and quality of the stories, so I hate saying that, but it's true. Next, I read Courtney Crumran and the Night Things by Ted Nafee, which is the first volume in the Courtney Crumran series, and I very much enjoyed this. It was kind of dark and creepy and unsettling, 
but in a way that I, I really like. <laughs> um, this is about a young girl named Courtney, of course, who moves with her terrible parents to live with her great uncle in his house. Her great uncle is actually like a warlock and she discovers magic, learns just enough to become dangerous, and learns about all the monsters and creepy crawlies and stuff. So this first volume is a collection of four stories of things that happen shortly after Courtney moves there, kind of setting the stage, I think, for uh, later stories. And I really liked it. Um, I, I like the character of Cor Courtney. She is not super likable, and that's part of who she is. She's a little disagreeable, um, and I really like it. I also ended up liking the artwork more than I thought I was going to. It's all in black and white, and at first I thought it was just going to be okay, but it actually really warmed up to it, and I, I quite like it. So I need to get volume two. Um, my libraries don't have it, so I'm hoping I can get the rest of the series through interlibrary loan. And then the last thing that I finished for Booktubeathon was another great surprise, and this is Monday Starts on Saturday by Arkady and Boris Strugatsky. I picked up a couple of books by the Strugatskys right after I finished Roadside Picnic last year because I liked that, and I kind of expected their work to be like that, a little serious on the darker side. So I was surprised when I started reading Monday Starts on Saturday and it was hilarious. The, it's basically a parody of academics and administration, like how people behave in academic and scientific institutions and just it was so funny this was written in the 60s yeah, it was published in 1964 originally and it's e even despite the the culture barrier and the barrier of time so much of this stuff is true <laughs> so this is what you would call science fantasy it's about um scientists and magicians attempting a scientific investigation into the rules of magic. So it begins when a man named Sasha is headed to a little town of Solovets in the Karelia region, I believe. He's going to meet up with some friends for a vacation. And he picks up two hitchhikers who uh, discover that he's a computer programmer, and they are desperate to offer him a job because they need a programmer at the institution they work at. He kind of gets roped into this. It's almost like they don't give him a choice. He's just along for the ride. Um, so in the first story, the first third, um, that's his arrival in Solovets, and he becomes aware of the bizarre magical stuff happening there. Um, the first story is called The Commotion Over the Divan. There's like this magical sofa that everyone's fighting about, and Sasha ends up sleeping on it in his first night in Solovets, and has these crazy dreams. The whole first story was like Alice in Wonderland, except Russian. <laughs> and then the second and third stories in this um, are when Sasha is working at this institution, the abbreviation for which in, in the English translation is nitwit. Um, and the, the strange things that happened there, some of the stuff didn't seem very connected. I'm not sure if there's an overall story here. It's more like a collection of three major stories with the same main character, but it was just so much fun. Uh, apparently there is a sequel, I think it's called Tales from the Troika, and it features a lot of the same characters, but it's a parody of something else. And I would love to read it. Unfortunately, I think that the English translation has been out of print for a really long time. Um, it's very expensive to get copies of it. So I'm hoping maybe it'll be re-released because a bunch of the Strugatsky's works have been retranslated and republished in recent years. So cross fingers, I would love to read the next one. And that is that! I ended my Booktubeathon on a high note, I think. It went very well, and I got through almost everything from my original TBR, except I did not start Before Mars. Did you notice that? I, once again, failed to start reading that book. I don't know why either. 
I don't know. I, I was running out of time. Um, so anyway, let me know how your booktube-a-thon went, and if you've read any of these books and you want to talk to me about them, leave me a comment down below. If I don't reply right away, that's because I'm about to fly out to San Jose for Worldcon, and if you want to know where I am, you can check me out on Twitter or on Instagram. I'll probably be tweeting about anxious travel stuff because, you know, airports. I'm really terrified. Um, <laughs> Go give me some emotional support on Twitter. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much for watching. I'll be back um, after Worldcon near the end of the month. And until then, bye.